American Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, A Path to a Career in Geophysics. Dr. Sergio Chavez Perez, Chair of the SCG Latin America Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori White, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by an extended question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you would like to ask questions, please raise your hand in the webinar interface. Uh, and I will move you where you can ask Maria your questions directly. And also, you can take advantage of the question and answer session uh, the box on the bottom of your screen. Our presenter today, Maria Angela Capello, is an awarded leader and author in the oil and gas industry, expert in reservoir management, women empowerment, and leadership strategies. She has more than 33 years of experience with a solid knowledge of national and service oil companies in the Middle East, the United States, and Latin America. Maria Capello is currently an executive advisor in Kuwait Oil Company and champions the standardization of reservoir management best practices across all directorates of the company. She also ensures the alignment of Shell technical programs with KOC's training ecosystem at corporate level. She is the lead advisor of the KPC Professional Women's Network for more than for the nine companies of the Kuwait Petroleum Corporation Holdings. Maria Capella was the first female supervisor of geophysical field operations in the swamps and flatlands of Venezuela for PDVSA, progressing to be general manager of several oil assets. Afterwards, she was subsurface and operations regional manager for Halliburton for Latin America and the Northern Arabian Gulf. With more than 57 publications, Maria Angela is the lead author of the book, Learned in the Trenches, Insights on Leadership and Resilience, that was published this year in 2018. She believes that improving an individual, team, or corporation starts with st clear strategic goals communicated in a simple and appealing way. Maria Capello is currently director at large and the 2018 honorary lecturer for the Middle East and Africa for the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. She has been SEG Vice President, Chair of the SEG Women's Network twice, and Global Affairs Committee. Uh, member, she has been a member of the Board of Directors of SEAM and the SEG Council, and was awarded the SEG Special Com Commendation and Lifetime Membership. Maria Angela Capella is a Distinguished Member, Distinguished Lecturer in 2018, an International Distinguished Service Awardee, and Associated Technical Editor for the Society of Petroleum Engineers. She received the GRIT Award by Pink Petro as a change maker in energy. Maria Capello has a uh, master's degree from Colorado School of Mines and is an accomplished pianist specializing in Baroque. She navigates work and life with her husband and two daughters. Welcome Maria Capello. Thank you for agreeing to present for us. Take it away. Thank you very much and uh, welcome all to this webinar. I was very pleased uh, when I was invited to be part of the Latin American Council series of webinars and uh, a little bit surprised that the topic was uh, to perhaps shed a light about a career in geophysics using my own. But um, overcoming uh, perhaps a little bit of shyness, I put together uh, the slides that I think will exemplify for you how I have uh, and continue to build my career. And it's not a coincidence, I have titled this presentation, My Roller Coasters, so far. So this is a stop in the way of uh, my career, and it was an opportunity for me to reflect on what has been instrumental so that I will try to share with you my own insights about how I have progressed my career in geophysics and beyond. So, we will see a little bit of an introduction, and then uh, we will focus on my formation years, early career, the evolving challenges, and what I think is the core of the whole thing. What was key and what will be key from my own point of view. So, what is a roller coaster? Well, the roller coaster is this kind of experience that we, I guess that we all have had, where you know you enter in, a, in the unknown generally, and it's marked by numerous ups and downs. I wanted to use this specific image because sometimes we hear, in, especially when we work in large corporations, that you know the career of a person is like a ladder, so you are compelled to climb and going upwards, upwards, always upwards. Whereas in my experience, the reality is that as it happens in life, a, a career is something much more complex 
that has many turns and many opportunities ahead of you, many also uh, drawbacks and difficulties and especially challenges. But what perhaps in this image is clear is that uh, you move around, but it is you who have to contain yourself and make sure that you enjoy the ride. So let's remember that roller coaster is also used as an adjective. So the most important element in what we do is our career. If it is a roller coaster career, well, that is a way to adjectivize what we do in our life, in our professional life. So why geophysics? Okay, so here I am. And uh, I am that little fish you see there, countercurrent and different. And you may wonder, well, why is that? Well, it so happened that I consider that I have always been part of the minority. I was born in an Italian family in Venezuela. And in Venezuela, I was, you know, going to, of course, the school and all. And I would, you know, be feeling, uh, I would be, you know, different in many ways. And my mother would pick me up at school and talk to me in Italian. And that made me feel awkward. And, you know, even it would be kind of a shame. And uh, now I look back and I wonder why I was feeling that way. But that is because you want to be part of what is the majority. You don't want to be different. It takes a lot of courage to be different. And perhaps being part of the minority since I was very little, helped me a lot to build my resilience, to build my thick skin, and also to understand that life and work is a compendium of all kinds of characters and people, each one of us different from the other. So this is perhaps one of the characteristics that will define and you will see all along my career what I have done and what and how I have done it. Okay, so when I finalized my high school, the time came to go to the university. And what you see here is the beautiful campus of Universidad Simón Bolívar in Venezuela. This photo was taken some years ago when it was still, you know, in its peak. I don't know how it is today, but when I started my studies at the university, that was the top technical university in all Latin America. And the field of study that I chose was physics. And you may wonder, okay, why physics? And that is, I studied and I chose physics because I love every single subject during high school. I would feel at ease with mathematics, with physics, with chemistry, even with the social uh, subjects. But in particular, physics, I was in love with that. And I consider physics to be such a, um, you know, important and foundational uh, subject of study that I, you know, was engaged and, and bought for the idea of studying physics. And that is how I started. You must know that I graduated from a high school that was all female. And uh, even if at the time I considered that that was very old fashioned, and probably it is, right? It nevertheless provided me with the platform of the understanding that there were no barriers for any one of us to excel at mathematics or physics. And I didn't have the opportunity of, you know, learning that, quote unquote, women or, or you know, baby girls were not good at math or at physics. I mean, that was absolutely non-existent because all of us were women, were young ladies at, at this high school. So I, when I entered the university and started to study physics, it was the first time in my life that I have heard that, oh, how strange a woman studying physics. By the way, I was the only one of my cohort. And as you can see, this is what I faced. And uh, I spent the first uh, three to four years, the career uh, of the Bachelor in Physics, 
in Venezuela is five years. And yes, this was physics. I ended up, you know, studying a lot of mathematics, algebra, analysis, and uh, pure physics uh, theory, laboratories, and many other things that, you know, engaged me in something that I very soon realized that perhaps Venezuela, the country, did not have the, the infrastructure to advance further what I would do in the field of laboratory physics. So from the beginning, I realized that if I was going to do something in physics, that would have been research, but in a lab, something applied. So I really had, you know, this um, appeal and, and I was attracted by the very core uh, subject of physics. But the, the whole thing, you know, changed after a while because in the year four, okay, I had to take uh, several elective subjects that are related to physics. And of course, I immediately enrolled in the advanced labs. But then I took one subject, and that was the geology and the physics summer camp of field trip. And I must say that that was the very beginning uh, that uh, the geophysics uh, professors were at the Simon Bolivar University, and they were launching what was a minor, like uh, you have a major in physics, and they wanted to launch a minor in geophysics. So they, they were offering several subjects, including this one that was a big camp, a whole subject that uh, included to go the field and acquire data with gravimeter and some electrical and refraction seismic data. Plus, the field camp included also a geologic uh, vision of the outcrops. And, uh, you know, like everybody else, the first time I understood that the rocks that were, you know, outcropping just, you know, in the, at the sides of the roads, in the mountains, had an explanation. I was, for the first time in my life, exposed to understand what a fault is or a fossil was, and, you know, have the opportunity to use instrumentation to record and to study and undertake it. And I was taught for the visits, like, you know, forever. I mean, it was for me an eye-opener. It was a moment of dawn. Suddenly, I realized that this is what I wanted to do. And uh, several factors were included in that uh, decision. First of all, I was in Venezuela. And, you know, if you look at the map of the country's proven oil reserves, and, uh, in, you know, even at that moment, Venezuela was the country with one of the most important reserves of oil in the world. Currently, after the new certification of oil reserves that include the Faja Petrolifera del Orinoco heavy oil uh, belt in Venezuela, Venezuela does have the largest proven oil reserves of the, of the world, surpassing those of Saudi Arabia. So I was in the right country to study what you know, was a core discipline for the oil industry. So all of a sudden, I realized that I had the opportunity to study and work in something that was very much applicable in the country where I was you know, living. So this is me in Venezuela, and uh, happy realizing that I could study geophysics, which was so closely related to what I was, you know, what it was in my heart. And all of a sudden, this future opens up in front of me. And uh, I start to realize that, wow, this is what I want to do. And then um, I start uh, by um, applying for an internship in one of the oil and gas operators in Venezuela, in the National Oil Company, actually. Corpo Vent was part of what was going to become PDVSA. And uh, it was the first time a physics student would apply for an industrial internship. I mean, I had to do so many meetings and to fill so many forms. 
I was like breaking the, the workflows and implementing something absolutely new in the department. I mean, the physics department was a pioneer department in the Universidad Simón Bolívar, but they never had anyone willing to go for an internship because there wasn't any for a physics student. Student. So all of a sudden, there was this lady, Maria Angela Capello, willing to do an internship. But the best part is that the oil industry wanted a physics student to do that. So in the understanding that I was going to be one of the first or the first student to be graduated with a minor in geophysics at the university, they, uh, you know, I was pioneering also uh, the implementation of the internship course. And I was very lucky because I was uh, part of an internship that Corpo Ben designed for me. And they organized, uh, first of all, three field trips, or let's say exposures of the industrial activities they were doing for geophysicists. First of all, they took me to see a logging of a well at the Maracaibo. And this image that you see in the slide is the beautiful uh, site of the oil derricks at the Maracaibo uh, Lake in the offshore, which is called Lagunilla. Area. It's very famous because from the early 20th century, it's been producing oil. And I was there and uh, all this experience, you can imagine that a person that was dealing with equation, every, equations of math and physics every day, all of a sudden gets to go into these large boats and pass all the HSC training and go to an oil rig, you know, and have this experience of seeing the logs first side, okay, of the well. The second thing is that in the opposite side of the country, in the eastern side, I go to this um, um, vibrator truck seismic acquisition of the 2D uh, survey. And then uh, again, I am exposed to see the waves that we are recording and the CDPs and understanding all that live. And the third experience was uh, the acquisition of the DSP. In, in the central Venezuela area for the gas fields. I was absolutely mesmerized. And I think that this was another of those huge steps that instilled the oil industry in my heart and in my mind and gave me this emotion to understand that what I was doing was useful and this is where I wanted to work. So, I graduated, and after that, I am offering, uh, I, I have been offered two jobs. One was in Corpo Ven, the same people that gave me my, my internship, and the other one was in Lago Ven. Corpo Ven wanted to hire me and put me to work in the most beautiful resort city, which is Puerto La Cruz in Venezuela. But that was far from my family in Caracas, and Lago Ven instead wanted to uh, hire me in Caracas, so I chose. Uh, my first job was with Lago Bay in the exploration department. I think it's needless to say that as soon as you take a decision, things happen and your life gets upside down. And yes, Lago Bay, even if they hire me in Caracas after six month, months of work in the office, yes, in the exploration department, yes in a very interesting uh, seismic interpretation of the Maracaibo Lake, off they sent me to be the first uh, woman in supervising uh, seismic operations in the flatlands and in the swamps of Venezuela, as Lori was saying. And this is a map of uh, all the area that I had to take care of. There were three seismic surveys that were being acquired at the same time. If you see here El Fubrial, okay, and Maturin, I was based here in this city, and we were acquiring, acquiring data in all this area, okay, near in the, in the front time mount, uh, in the front of this, and then all the flatlands in this kind of rivers that are called Morichales, okay, near that. All this is a swamp. You cannot see here very well, but all this is like an anagated uh, zone. 
it was kind of interesting because uh, those were the years where El Fubial, which is the super giant uh, light oil field in eastern Venezuela, was discovered. And it, it is still producing and sustaining what, whatever is left of the oil industry in Venezuela that we know is going you know, through a very difficult period. These were years of learning. I was there for two years. It was the first time in my life that I was living and uh, facing this kind of root work alone. And uh, it was for me a learning experience that grounded what um, I may have for a strong character, I could say. After that, when I finalized it, I returned to Caracas and I was uh, working in production in Lago in Caracas. But then I got married, and uh, maybe this is good that I clarify why I was changed, and I changed to work in ITB, which was the Research and Development Center of PDVSA. And this is a photo of the magnificent uh, facilities that uh, ITB uh, had or has. And the thing is that um, I was pregnant with our first daughter, and uh, we were living near Interve because my husband used to work uh, also in the oil industry and he was working in Interve. And we were uh, living in a beautiful house nearby Interve. But as I love my work, I would commute every day more than an hour to Caracas to go to Lago Bay. The thing is that when I got pregnant, the doctor said, we better don't do this kind of you know, commuting every day, one one hour and a half going, one hour coming back. And uh, it was a mountain road and all that. So I asked for a transfer, if there was any transfer. I was lucky. There was a fellow that was assigned to, to Lago Ben from Quebec that he wanted to remain uh, and work in Lago Ben. And he also had three months, which was the maternity leave time that nobody wanted to have. And so they exchanged the two employees. I was exchanged for a male employee that had three years pending vacation month. And they accepted me, a woman employee that I was going to deliver. And I, they had to, to have this paid maternity leave of three months for me. So it was a coincidence, but it was a very glad coincidence, uh, coincidence that enabled me to start working almost immediately after taking the decision and the courage to ask for that. I remember that to ask for the change, I directly uh, asked for a meeting with the DC or the deputy CEO, or you may want to say the vice president or general manager of, of uh, exploration. And uh, all my supervisors, the immediate, and that means that I jumped four uh, hierarchies, no? And uh, all the three bosses before that, they were asking me if there was something wrong, what happened. But I, I just wanted to directly ask for the, to the big boss, let's say. And he immediately understood it. And uh, he took the phone and he called the president of Interweb. And uh, the change was done in less than a week. So sometimes you have to take the courage and understand that it is you who needs to take care of your family uh, conditions, your work and life balance, and uh, what you want to achieve in life. So, Interweb uh, being a research center was a fantastic grounds for me to um, expand my knowledge. It is thanks to Interweb that uh, I, after three years of being evaluated number one, um, I was offered a scholarship to do a master degree, and I ended up in the Colorado School of Mines uh, studying geophysics with my battle and rock physics uh, in particular. I model for the effects in carbonate rocks using the equation of cost of toxins. And when I returned it, uh, it was a natural thing that I was going to work for the seismic. Very soon after only three months of that, I was appointed as a project manager for the first ever for this disability project and studies in Venezuela. We did many things there. And I, I am proud to tell you that I was invited to the RARA session, which is the recent advances and road ahead 
of the OTC conference to showcase what I was doing in Venezuela with four D sites. We were pioneering, we were doing many things. I was also invited to Statoil in, in Norway, which is now, um, what the name? They changed the name. And uh, to present what I was doing with four D sites within Venezuela, because that was really pioneering work. After the 4D seismic project, I would like to highlight <clears throat> that I led the LIC Santa Rosa um, project. LIC means Laboratory Integrated, uh, Laboratorio Integrado de Campo in Spanish. That means Integrated Field Laboratory. In the very traditional area of Venezuela, producing gas and oil, I was able to handle uh, the research done with new methods of drilling, including fluid, drilling fluids, and um, integration of uh, dynamic and static modeling. We did, uh, for the first time, uh, seismic stratigraphy in Venezuela, pressure analysis of transients, and we demonstrated how uh, it was feasible to produce the reservoirs in a communal um, scheme of production. This enabled uh, several fields not to be closed and it was a breakthrough uh, even for the Ministry of Oil in Venezuela to understand what were the technical grounds needed in order to support and to approve communal production. It was a first and uh, I think in this period of my career I jumped from doing only and purely geophysics to work in integrated um, projects. And I was able to do that because starting before the seismic, I was talking not anymore to other geophysicists or geologists. I was talking to reservoir engineers. I was um, addressing the issues of the fluids and not the rocks. I was focusing on what we are selling, which is oil and gas. And that enabled me later on to do integrated works. And uh, then I expanded the scope of my work and the scope of my, you may want to call it leadership as well. Then uh, after the success of uh, the integrated field laboratory came the time of Petro UCB. Petro UCB was an initiative of PDVSA to jointly manage with the university an oil field. Imagine how audacious is that, that you can use the profits of an oil field for two things, to further advance knowledge, practical knowledge, and application of an oil field for petroleum engineers, geologists, and geophysicists, and to provide funds for the university because in Venezuela, the, the education at university level is not, uh, you don't have to pay for that, as it happens, for example, in the States, right? So with this beautiful partnership idea, uh, we uh, launched uh, this with the Universidad Central, which is the more traditional and largest university in Venezuela. I was appointed reservoir manager for that, and after uh, a while, after two years, I was appointed the general manager of the three assets that belonged at that time to Petro UCB, Socororo and, and Caricar. So doing that, I was able to be in charge of uh, preparing and uh, assuring the um, approval of field development plans, uh, drilling, uh, four to five wells, doing more than 15 uh, work covers, and uh, taking these marginal fields up to produce. These were very difficult times in political terms in Venezuela. And after that, you know, there was a big from all in Venezuela where many people were dismissed, and uh, all these issues uh, were very heavy on the lives of those who, like me, had to live through those, okay? And after a short time, I was uh, working in Halliburton. I was appointed a regional subsurface practice manager in Venezuela for Latin America. 
and then regional operations manager for the Northern Arabic Group. I picked this photo because only recently Haliburto has softened the image and perhaps included even women in their um, images as a corporate culture. It was not easy to work those uh, years in Haliburto, in Venezuela, when many of our leaders and bosses from you know, Houston uh, were men. I also was one of the very first regional uh, managers and to craft what I had to do was also uh, something that taught me a lot. I think that coming out from the Bebeza to Haliburton uh, was not a single step um, because I had to learn a different culture, a different uh, way of working. I will always be very grateful. I think that Harry Burton also provided me the opportunity to work in a multinational dimension, working with many countries at the same time, working in English, which uh, before I was working in Spanish all the time, using English, but not all the time, and providing me also with some rigorosity in the application of workforce, which is very important. After Halliburton, I came to Kuwait. Uh, it is a story related to SEG in many ways because while I was working in Halliburton, I was elected vice president of SEG. And when I went that year, um, 2005, to the annual meeting, which was in Houston, my husband came along. And uh, while I was on duty, quote unquote, uh, he was on the exhibition floor and he was offered a job by Kuwait or company. So I went, um, you know, ahead and I said, oh, that's great. Maybe there are other offerings and, and uh, opportunities. But the thing is that he chose to go to Kuwait or company. And uh, the plan was that I was going to stay in Venezuela because at the time we thought that all the issues in Venezuela would soon be solved, which is not yet the situation in Venezuela. And to, we are talking now 2018 and things are still going very sour in Venezuela. The thing is that uh, life happens and when he went to Kuwait, um, I had an issue and uh, in Venezuela there is something called, uh, you know, robbery which is called express kidnapping. And that happened to me and our two daughters. I was driving with them and we were experiencing this very horrible experience. And uh, that was another eye opener. I said, wow, things are really bad. And uh, I was, you know, lucky to, to have come out of that struggle without major issues, especially for my two daughters, our two daughters. And I realized what I am doing here alone. We are a family, we should do together. So I explored opportunities and I applied for the opportunity of uh, for um, operations manager based in Kuwait. And being a woman, the first thing that they asked me in the interview was, why on earth would a person like you want to come to Kuwait? And uh, well, they flew me to Kuwait in, in February and March, and uh, they wanted to know me, they were hesitant. I now realize why, because I was a woman and I was going to, to be the first uh, manager, regional manager, woman in this part of the world, in the Middle East, for Halliburton. And they hired me, so I asked, uh, to wait until the school year was over, which is in June, they accepted, and I started my work in July. After two years, I was the one knocking at the door of the Waiter Company, because I think that I am built for, a, for an oil operating company, and I started, uh, they have several roles, starting from, uh, for example, uh, geophysicist, uh, senior geophysicist, uh, specialist in geophysicist, and then you have consultant, and now I am consultant one. So I have evolved uh, from a group-based uh, activity to a corporate uh, scope of influence in Kuwait or company. 
I want to show you several images of the things that I have done. This photo is from this year. And this is me with the reservoir management uh, group of the initiative that standardizes the application of um, reservoir management best practices across the company. And here you see uh, several of the managers uh, in their national dresses and the leaders and several of the specialists and uh, experts that work in this market. This photo is, is probably also very instrumental for you to understand that culture pervades everywhere in every organization and corporation that you go. You see here all the ladies together and also all the Kuwaitis are together and the experts are behind. I mean, there is a lot of nuances that you can read in this photo. This is me in the center. And again, I think that I am that fish different from the rest. Uh, this is me among the two uh, managers, leaders of this initiative, and uh, I hope that you can see how happy I am when I am in this kind of activities. This uh, also tries to summarize what I do. Uh, this is in the gathering centers when I go and, and explain what are the, the planning, uh, you know, the development plans and strategy uh, for, the, for the company that I try to cascade down uh, even to the level of the operators because I am convinced that everyone needs to know what are we going to do and produce in the company. This is me in the towers of uh, Kuwait. I, it was taken for the Lean group. I also do things that are related to the community and with the society in Kuwait. And this is a recent uh, photo of my honorary lecture in, um, with SEG that I have been giving in South Africa, um, Nigeria, Saudi, um, and other places. That is part of the activities I do, which are technical and at the corporate level. And I like to say those are with my right hand. With my left hand, which is the soft skills, what I do is uh, this is the committee for the seven companies, uh, now nine companies that are subsidiaries of KPC, Kuwait Petroleum Corporation. And what I do is that I envision and created uh, this uh, initiative to empower women in Kuwait from having uh, nothing to being able to have uh, upgraded, for example, the facilities for women in operations is a great thing to do. And the incorporation of them in international conferences is something great. Now, when I do my honorary lectures, this is in South Africa, I also require or kindly ask to have specific meetings related to the women. And this is something that I developed in my career as a by uh, activity, let's say, that has become more and more and more important. I didn't consider myself to be an expert in this kind of empowerment of women, but I practically, I had to become one by force because I was called into action. And as you can see, all of them are Kuwaitis. I am the only expert in this story. And in a way, I developed my knowledge and skills in this by doing and by uh, researching myself. This was recently, uh, I volunteered extensively and I would suggest that you do the same. I think that my volunteering with SPE, which is to the left and to SEG to the right, these are the awards I have received. This is the Distinguished International Distinguished Service Award. And uh, in the right side is my special commendation of SCG, uh, just given to me now in October. Um, I consider that volunteering for SCG and SPE has um, given me the, the opportunity to expand my network and to exert a leadership and comprehension of the multiculturalism to levels that I would not have achieved alone, only with the work. And I have to appreciate that KOC also provided me with the freedom to do this and the opportunity to do this. I'm very, very happy about that. I want to highlight that I also was, as a coincidence, I was honored to receive my two awards this year by the two women presidents of these organizations after many, many years, they didn't have women in the presidency. 2018 
has been an excellent year for me. And I want to share with you that I published, uh, I mean, I, my book, I am the leading author for Learn in the Trenches. What I did is that I compiled my own insights and those of my co-author, Hosni Hashim, the Kuwaiti Deputy CEO, and those of 18 leaders in the industry uh, in a book. This was published by Springer, and I am very proud about that. I think that uh, you have an idea and uh, you need to put it into action. Not many people are able to liaise with the local Kuwaiti nationals to engage in initiatives like this. And maybe I am blessed to be able to do that, but the thing is that I encourage you to pursue these kind of ideas which go beyond your everyday work. So if I were to summarize my career in blogs, I would say that Televesa has a big chunk and KOC has a big chunk. And you remember I told you that my, my step towards Halliburton was not uh, immediate. That is because in the middle, I, uh, something kind of funny happened to me. I contacted Stanton and Chase, which is an executive firm, a uh, search firm for people. And uh, they hired me. This is the, one of the very few cases, I don't know if there are others, but they hired me to launch their oil and gas uh, executive search firms. So that is an, an interesting story that perhaps another moment we will, we will tell. I also delivered several and crafted several courses for NEXT, which is the training uh, branch of Schlumberger. And I became uh, the executive director of a not-for-profit organization, which is the Alumni Association for the Universidad Central de Venezuela. And that was also a fantastic opportunity for me to liaise with the most important board of directors of the private and public sector, governmental sector in Venezuela. Then there is Harry Gorton, that you know of, in two different regions of the world, and KLC. And on purpose, I have these block, blocks ahead of me because I, I feel that I still have a lot to do, a lot to give, and uh, I have this passion to keep building what I'm doing. I cannot but also highlight for you how important for me is my presence online. I consider that um, my presence online has given me the opportunity to meet people that I never knew before and to update what I care about on a daily basis. Uh, if you were to ask me what do I um, consider more important for me is my Twitter, my LinkedIn, what I do for the SEG Women Network and SEG Honorary Lecture, what I do in the Facebook that encompasses also the SEG and SPE pages, and my LinkedIn as well. And the, of course, SPE. I have started my own blog. I have a shy presence on Snapchat. And I have also my Instagram uh, account. So yes, I am like uh, all over uh, the place, but I would encourage you to take, if you have not done that, to take your steps to have your own presence online, to expand your professional uh, imprint, let's say, on social media. Going towards the end of my presentation, uh, perhaps what I would like to summarize is that I have become uh, my own gold, golden fish and uh, each one of us is different and I have my own, um, you know, shape, size and characteristics. I have developed that in three different uh, main countries in the world, Venezuela, the US, and Kuwait. And going out from my comfort area, which is something that I would think was for me foundational, very, very important for me. And uh, I have uh, been, I think, always the same person. Maybe this characterizes who I am, the smile, the openness, and uh, the willing to, to help and, and curiosity to learn every day more and not having fear 
of uh, going ab above and beyond the usual comfort area to do more, this is me. And uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, this is good and sometimes bad because I cannot hide what I think or what my emotions. Maybe that's very the, my Italian side, probably. So <laughs> I laugh when I see this because through time, you have to become uh, a shark to survive, of course, in the corporate world. But deep inside, I keep being the same person that you always know. It's very difficult for me to pretend to be a shark because I'm not. And the thing is that I have uh, grown my career by helping others, I would say, and not by hurting others. So if you were to ask me who I am, who am I? This is the formal uh, summary that I have created, okay? When I introduce who am I? I prefer all the other slides that tell a story. But here you can see that there is a summary that uh, we have already discussed. This is my book. This is my work with the women. These are my three countries that I love so much, Italy, Venezuela, and Kuwait. This is what I do with uh, my volunteering, my KOC work, my mentoring work, and the communities in Kuwait. So this is who I am, who I am no? for you. And uh, what was key and what will be key for me? Okay. This is my last, uh, let's say, summary that I want to share. What would I recommend? Well, that there is no substitute for hard work. And this is the most important. If I want to tell you how I did it or continue to do it, I would say I work hard, very hard. And I would recommend that you find a mentor. I have had several um, excellent mentors. One was uh, for sure Dr. Mike Batson, okay? And I have had others which are fantastic mentors. I would suggest that you expand your network because looking at how things are done by different people helps you and teaches you a lot. And to support others. For me, every time that I have given, I have mentored, I have tutored someone, I have been enriched more, I have received more than what I have given. Do keep learning, do take risks. And this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was an excellent presentation and very interesting um, career um, that you've had. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up for uh, some questions. You can either raise your hand in the webinar interface or you can use the question and answer uh, box on the bottom of your screen. And uh, typically, uh, our, our attendees are a little bit shy um, to begin with. So maybe I'll ask a question to start us off. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you've had quite a wide variety and uh, of work and experiences, but um, your career with Halliburton, um, it seems uh, that it was also uh, not only rewarding and challenging, but uh, a bit of, uh, uh, of an adjustment to the culture um, of that, that company. Uh, are there any specific steps or things that people, students, and emerging professionals can look for when trying to navigate uh, cultures in companies? That's kind of a, a tricky well, question. Uh, that, is, that is a tricky question, you're right. And uh, perhaps I consider that um, it's not easy to answer. But I would suggest that uh, in order to navigate different cultures in the corporate sense, you have to remain flexible, open, and patient because uh, you have to ask many questions before you understand what is the quote-unquote correct way to address uh, certain workers in the corporations. And I noticed working in Harry Burton that the culture was different in, in Latin America than in the Middle East. So not always a company has the same culture all over the world. So it, you also have to navigate what is uh, the local uh, side of, um, you know, the application of that co corporate culture. 
Thank you. We have a question uh, from Anna, and uh, Anna will be able to ask you her question directly. Okay. Hi. Just a second. Um, uh, yeah, and he's here. Hi, it's Anna Curcio from Argentina. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Laurie, for this opportunity of uh, contacting Maria Angela. I felt very moved and very, how to say, identified with your story since I'm also a physicist and there is a break when you go to university and then when you join the physics world. Um, yes, a, a question. Um, because sometimes I feel that uh, I work in, in some companies, all companies, and now I'm finishing my PhD. And I saw that you were joined, or you were, you were, no, you are a manager of team project. And I, went, I, I was very interested in this project because uh, my PhD is related to this. Um, but my perception is that there is not uh, some place for people that are not uh, related to a corporation. And I would like to ask you if there is any way of finding a place in this type of project. In the projects of uh, research in geophysics, you mean? No, I mean with SIM. If in a project of SIM, the microsismic. Ah, SIM. Sorry oh. that Spanish, maybe my English is not very good. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I think that uh, there are some companies of uh, seismic processing that might be interested. And also uh, in the academy, in the universities, there might be space for that. And uh, I am sure if you contact some of the researchers that are leading the activities of SIM, you will be able to also explore those opportunities for you. Are you based in Argentina? Yes, I contacted. I contacted. I think that first Mrs. Oakley, Senora Oakley, Oakley. Yes. And then someone who is uh, Stephen Wilson. Okay. Um, he makes me some question, but I don't know what happened. Uh, my perception is that they didn't find the place for me. Maybe it's, it's okay. They don't have the place. But uh, I would like to ask you if this is like um, a private uh, project or if there is any opportunity of joining or adding okay. extra people no i i think that uh, there could be opportunities especially mm -hmm. for um in i don't know if that would be volunteering work or participation but if you want uh, i can put you in contact with uh, not only miss oakley but also uh, some of the researchers so that you can take this conversation further and okay. perhaps detail more what is that you want and then to explain to you what is what they can offer okay okay that will be great for me thank you thank you Anna thank you for your question ah thank you um so uh there is another question that came in and um it, it seems to be a, a little bit uh, more general but uh, still very interesting question. And they were uh, curious, um, how do you uh, deal with oftentimes being one of the, the few women uh, working in different companies and organizations? Is there any specific um, skill uh, other than, I guess, patience, like you mentioned previously, that well, would be uh, required to yeah. be successful? Well, you know that there are no recipes, but certainly uh, you have to forget you are the only one this or only one that. And I think that being, being part of always a minority, I told you that, uh, that when I was growing up, I was like the only Italian uh, little girl at school. So that was a minority for sure. Then at the university, I was the only woman in physics. Then, uh, when, for example, when I studied at the geophysics department at the Colorado School of Mines, at my time, I was the only woman in the master uh, program. And then um, every time, uh, it's like pioneering being the only one. Maybe I have become, uh, also in, in, in the US, I was the only Latin, from Latin America, from Venezuela. Uh, in the geophysics, right? There was another fellow who was from Brazil, but he was a man, right? And uh, 
So I was twice a minority, let's say, by two elements. And you, you ask, okay, how you handle? Well, I think that I forget I am the only one. I, and I, the key is to have an attitude of no barriers. So does that mean the barriers will disappear? No. But at least you will not sit in the back of the room. You sit at the table. I think I have, if I think I have an opinion, I will express it, okay? I will not feel shy. And if anybody tries to uh, hamper my voice or talk over me about what I'm trying to do, I, I would say, excuse me, I have not finished or, you know? So you become stronger through time. But uh, there are no recipes. I think that my recipe is thinking that there are no impossibles. And uh, maybe, um, you know, you fake it until you make it, and then uh, things happen. And it is generally in a way that they flourish. When you plant seeds, they flourish. And uh, make sure that you do not hamper yourself. That is the most important element. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question asks, what, what, if any, were the most challenging things uh, about working in um, the field in Venezuela when you first started, when you were working in the swamps and the flatlands? What was the most well, challenging thing? <laughs> there were several. Um, I know it's trivial, but for me, it was very difficult to uh, learn to drive in, in the muddy, uh, you know, terrain with a jeep with a stick, you know, and using the four-wheel drive. And uh, also, I always say the geologists have an easier life to go to the, to the well uh, when they are, you know, drilling wells because they have a, almost, you know, a paved way to get to the well. But geophysicists, at least in the oil industry, are the first to go to an area. And uh, in, in Venezuela, it was a challenge for me because I don't have a good sense of orientation. And I like to say I am from the maybe a little bit Jurassic age. <laughs> and in a way, there was no GPS, there was no internet, or there was no, there, were, there were maps. And I didn't have a good sense of orientation. So for me to try to reach every day to the recording truck, right? Where I had to do the instrumentation tests and all that. And this recording truck was changing location every day. For me, it was very difficult. So uh, to drive to the location, sometimes two hours, okay? To get to a place in the middle of nowhere, everything flat, no, uh, you know, uh, orientation uh, points. And uh, in very muddy uh, terrain was difficult. I remember one time, I, my jeep was stuck in the mud, I couldn't get it out. And uh, with the radio, I was calling the base camp and the recording truck. And they told me, we cannot go to pick you up now. You have to wait until the end of your trip. So at dawn, at 6, 7 p.m., is when they came to, to, to pick me up. So for one hour, I was waiting in the truck in, in my Jeep, relaxed, then two hours, three hours, and then I, I decided to go out. And when I go out, I just was, you know, deepening into the mud. When I took out uh, one feet, okay, it came out without the boot that was totally um immersed in the mud so when they came back okay to pick me up i was without boots totally dirty in mud sweaty i mean it was a horrible day that day i thought i was going to quit but if i didn't quit that day i don't have to to fear anything else that is why i quit. That was, that was, that was very interesting. We have another question. So um, please ask your question, Anna. Thank you. Uh, Angela, uh, do you think that um, regarding women in geoscience, do you think that maybe today companies uh, are pressured 
to hire women? Or do you think that they discover something and 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 they are hired? I, I'm always in that. I don't know if they discover all the talent of women or if they are pressure on higher women. I'm just, I always wonder about this. What do you think? Yeah. I think that it's a mixture of both factors. Um, it occurs to me that women, especially in Latin America, Anna, have always been working in, in geology, especially in paleontology. There are many, and uh, sedimentology, many women that have been pioneers in um, Argentina, in Ecuador, in Venezuela, Colombia, and they were very well known for their capacity. Now, there is also a world movement to uh, support women. And I think that they have realized that we are not troublemakers, we are facilitators. And uh, it is my opinion, I might be wrong, but women have a natural capacity for communication and integration that is very, very uh, valuable when working in things related to production and exploration because you naturally tend to integrate the information and to join the teams. You are not shy to communicate. It's, it's a way of working. I think you are right. They are discovering the talent, which is uh, it's a hidden talent, perhaps, that not discovered until recently. And now that there is no, no wonder in sending women to the field, uh, I think that they finally have like a green light to hire, you know, men or women indistinctively, and uh, maybe sometimes even preferentially. Thank you. Welcome. All right, great. Um, we have uh, one other question from uh, the same person who asked you uh, what was the most challenging thing. They uh, also want to know, for you personally, what was the, if possible, the one most rewarding thing that you've ever done in your career? In my career, for, for real, the, the, maybe, <laughs> that is a very good question. And uh, I think that when I saw, uh, there are two things. One, I remember I published uh, an atlas with all the study done for the uh, integrated field laboratory of Santa Rosa. And uh, at that moment, I realized that I was able to lead teams of reservoir engineering drillers. And imagine that that laboratory included even the ecological integration of the ripples of the drilling to the terrains. Imagine, I mean, it was a complete study, the dynamic simulation, the static simulation, the pressures, the, um, all the data. I mean, it was an atlas that we compiled with all this integrated study that was a wonder. I think that was a very rewarding moment for me when I saw Learn in the Trenches published my first book. It was very rewarding. And uh, perhaps uh, sometimes I think the best moment is every day. I just rehearsed the, the young professionals that are going to present the, the assets briefings of KOC at Adipe. And I put together those uh, six presentations myself, polishing them, and then mentoring those young professionals how to deliver the presentations. And this was last week, and on Thursday, off they went. And uh, I didn't get to go to Adipec this year, but it felt so rewarding. I, I think that the, the most rewarding moment comes unexpectedly, and, there has been peaks in my career, yes, but I think every every moment I I keep building things and and uh, results and successes are coming along, and I get joy in the small things as much as in the big ones. So I don't know if this answers the question, but this is my my take. 
No, I think that was a very interesting and a good uh, question, uh, answer um, to that question, which was a very hard question to try to pin down one possible thing out of an entire career of many, many successes. So um, if does anybody else have any additional questions for Maria? All right, we are actually a little bit out of time. So I think with that, uh, I will uh, just wrap up for everybody. Um, and thank you, Maria, and uh, thank everyone who attended the SEG Latin America Regional Advisory Committee's webinar. As part of our webinar series, A Path to a Career in Geophysics, um, we will send you a follow-up email and you can let us know uh, what we could do better. Um, and also, if you'd like, please provide suggestions for future webinar topics. So please look forward to our social media posts to register for next month's interesting talk by Gladys Gonzalez. Uh, and thank you again uh, for attending and thank you very much, Maria, for a very interesting presentation. I, thank I you. appreciate it greatly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank have you. A, have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.